Hello, everybody. Chuck Holton here, and I'm live in Jerusalem right now. Uh, and we've got some breaking news. Uh, a couple of things, uh, actually, that are important. First of all, we just got news that Israeli authorities have confirmed the presence of uh, blood DNA traces uh, from blood from 19 year old hostage Liri Albag in a room 130 feet underground in a tunnel in Gaza. Uh, this is the first we've heard of this, uh, and I, I wanted to put that up quickly. I'll show a picture here of Liri Albag, 19 year old girl. Uh, they found traces of her DNA in a tunnel in Gaza, underground there. Uh, so let's pray that she's alive and that they actually can rescue her. That would be amazing. Uh, and that's not the, the that's not the breaking news that I started with uh, when I was starting to do this. I actually came on early, uh, about half an hour early, because we got a lot going on and I wanted to get to it and I didn't wanna wait. Uh, so we, I'm in Jerusalem, for those of you who are asking, uh, downtown Jerusalem, King David Hotel is right off that direction. This is the YMCA Hotel, a very amazing building uh, where we've been staying for a couple days. And uh, thank you for those of you who sent messages to the front desk of the, <laughs> of the uh, YMCA uh, to give me advice on how to do the lives uh, from this morning. So. Yeah, thank you for coming on. And uh, we do have some breaking news. The title of this live is that uh, Israel got thrown under the bus. And that's exactly what happened today. Uh, they had a vote at the UN Security Council uh, on a resolution to call for an immediate ceasefire. And I guess that wouldn't be surprising uh, because they've been talking about do that, doing that for some time, but there's some nuance here that we need to break down, okay? Uh, first of all, the United States, if you look at the progress, uh, they are moving steadily away from Israel in terms of supporting Israel in its battle against Hamas. And so that means if you're moving away from Israel, uh, then you are moving toward Hamas. There's no third direction here. And they have been, they started out, Joe Biden came, you know, stood with uh, Netanyahu and said, we're by your side, we're with you, come what may, no matter what, you have a right to defend yourselves and we're gonna be here to help you every step of the way. Well, then that turned into, uh, hey, you need to do this and do that in, in your fight against Hamas. Uh, we need to have a, uh, a humanitarian pause. It's not a ceasefire, it's a humanitarian pause. I'm not sure what the difference is, but that's what they started calling for. And when they got their humanitarian pause, then it went, started out, well, we need to make that pause permanent. All along, Israel has been saying, release the hostages. We need the hostages back. We want to get the hostages back. Even just in the last couple of days, Israel has put forward a, uh, it's put forward a proposal to get 40 more hostages back in exchange for 700 Palestinian murderers and terrorists. So they're going to let 700 murderers and terrorists go in order to get 40 more hostages out. And Hamas has not even responded to that proposal yet. Part of the reason probably because it's difficult for Hamas to communicate right now because they're too busy hiding underground uh, and trying to keep from getting killed, okay? And now you, you might, now I just saw somebody say 700 hostages or 700 prisoners, no, uh, well, I, I hear you, I hear you, but think about this. Think about the sort of covert benefit 
that Israel might actually achieve from releasing 700 prisoners out of their jails back into Gaza. Uh, it's very likely, and Israel knows this, everybody knows this, very likely that if they release those prisoners from the, their prisons and send them back to Gaza, that those, uh, some of, at least some portion of those prisoners are going to go right back into the fight. And then Israel gets to kill them. Think about that. So right now, Israel has to feed and house thousands of Palestinian prisoners who have been picked up for all manner of offenses, ranging from terrorism to murder, you know, whatever. But if they let them go and send them back to Gaza and those guys turn around and become combatants, now Israel gets to kill them. Well, that's a lot cheaper in terms of resources than it would be to keep them in prison for the next 15 years uh, is, you know, go, let's let them become martyrs. Well, the only problem with that, I mean, the only hitch in that plan is that uh, it puts their own troops at risk. There's a good chance that some Israeli troops may lose their lives because they have 700 more fighters on the field uh, for Hamas. But that's a trade-off that perhaps they are thinking about making. Suffice it to say, the Hamas leadership has not even got back to them on that. And now the UN Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. They, the, the United States had put forward, now this is where we get into the ridiculous, uh, you know, semantics of diplomacy. The United States had been putting forward a resolution that was egregious enough that has said that they, they were putting trying to vote on a resolution trying to pass it that said it is imperative that there be an immediate ceasefire and a release of hostages now that fell this short of actually calling for a ceasefire it just said it was important that that, that we get one I mean, to me, I, I'm, I'm not sure how, we're talking about some pretty fine hairs we're splitting here when it comes to the, the diplomatic language at the UN. But the, at least the United States was stopping short of actually calling for a ceasefire. It was just saying it was important that we get one, whatever. But that one never even made it to being voted on the one that got voted on was put forward by Russia and Iran and China and those guys uh, that said that they called for an immediate ceasefire and there's no mention of a release of hostages. Now, so, so they're just saying Israel needs to stop fighting, which is the same as saying Israel needs to give up and lose and Hamas wins, okay? I mean, there's there's no difference. Now, the United States had the power to veto that resolution and they didn't do it. They backed away from vetoing this resolution, which means they did not stand with Israel here. They didn't vote for the resolution. They just abstained, which is like saying, I'm not really here. We're just going to pretend we're not here. We're not going to take a stand. Well, when you take a stand, when you refuse to take a stand, you are taking a stand. And that stand is cowardice. And that's exactly what the Biden administration did today. They took a cowardly stand against Israel and refused to veto this resolution in the UN. Now, what comes of this resolution? They're, you know, they're not going to send UN peacekeepers in here to enforce a ceasefire. That's not going to happen. Now, they could go from this resolution to calling for sanctions against Israel, to putting pressure on the United States and other countries to 
stop supporting Israel, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to do whatever they can to make it harder on Israel. And every the, the thing that Israel pointed out is that every step they take to make it harder on Israel makes it easier on got on Hamas. Now, I'm not even going to justify these free Palestine idiots with a response. Um, I want to read for you the response that Benjamin Netanyahu gave uh, to this resolution passing. I'm sorry, this was uh, from the prime minister, from, from the prime minister's office. I'm going to read this thing in its entirety because I think it's important. Okay. All right. This person needs to go bye-bye and hide user on this channel. Okay. All right. So I'm going to read this for you. The United States has abandoned its policy in the UN today. Just a few days ago, it supported a security council resolution that linked a, a call for a ceasefire to the release of hostages. China and Russia vetoed that resolution partly because they opposed a ceasefire that was linked to the release of hostages. Why would they do that? Why would they oppose a ceasefire that's linked to the release of hostages? Are they, I mean, do you know what they're saying here, right? I mean, do, do you see what that's saying? That's without a doubt, that is making the case that Hamas has the right to take and hold hostages from Israel. That's their stand. Regrettably, the United States did not veto the new resolution, which calls for a ceasefire that is not contingent on the release of hostages. This constitutes a clear departure from the consistent U.S. position in the Security Council since the beginning of the war. Today's resolution gives Hamas hope that international pressure will force Israel to accept a ceasefire without the release of our hostages, thus harming both the war effort and the effort to release the hostages. Now, think about that. Think about that. If the United States, if the Biden administration really wanted this thing to be over quickly and wanted to you know, reduce the suffering of the hostages and reduce the suffering of the people in Gaza, then they would do whatever it took to help Israel finish this fight sooner rather than later. That would be the way to get this over with, to come up with a permanent cessation of hostilities. The best way to do that is to help Israel win as soon as possible. But instead, today's resolution is going to draw the war out longer because it's going to give Hamas hope that if they just hold out, if they just create more suffering on, uh, among their people, then the world body will do their work for them. Hamas won't have to defeat Israel because the UN will do it for them. Okay. Now, I talked about, uh, first of all, let me just finish this statement. And this is uh, the fallout now. Prime Minister Netanyahu made it clear last night that should the U.S. depart from its principled policy and not veto this harmful resolution, he will con uh, cancel the Israeli delegation's visit to the United States. In light of the change in U.S. position, PM Netanyahu decided that the delegation will remain in Israel. Okay? Think about that. Think about that. The, the, the distance between the Israeli government and the United States government is going like this. We know that the Bible says that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. We're moving, uh, the Biden administration is moving the United States closer to being cursed by God. And the sad thing is most people I think in the United States still support Israel. The, 
the very vocal minority who supports Hamas gets a lot of press because they are out of the ordinary. I mean, news exists to report the out of the ordinary, right? So they're getting a lot of ink in the press right now because they're freaks, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the sentiment of the American people. But now let's go back to why Russia might want to veto a resolution that calls for the release of hostages and why they would call for a ceasefire in which Israel loses. Well, Russia's goal in this is very pragmatic, very self-serving. Russia wants to draw out any conflict that's going to dilute the United States' attention from the war in Ukraine, that's going to cost the United States money, that's going to make the United States more divided as we come into an election cycle. Russia wants this war to continue for as long as possible because the, the war in Israel certainly has helped Russia in its war with Ukraine because it's divided the American people, it's diluted our attention, and it's, uh, it's cost the U.S. a lot of money that might otherwise have gone to, to Ukraine. And so it makes sense that Russia would want to do, they're going to take whatever step they can. They're going to vote the way they can in the UN to cause this war to go on longer and longer and longer. Now, they've been calling for more and more aid uh, every, every day. I mean, if you look on Twitter, if you make the mistake of looking on Twitter or X, <laughs> You're going to see the head of the United Nations, uh, Gutierrez, talking just constantly about the need for more aid, more aid, more aid, more aid. Well, guess what? We were, uh, it came out today that Israel has provided so much aid to Gaza that the United Nations and, and others who are responsible for actually distributing that aid have not been able to distribute it. So it's actually piling up on the border. I mean, there's just aid piling up. They just can't even get it in there. And, and they, but they still keep calling for more. Again, because their purpose here has nothing to do with alleviating the suffering of the Palestinian people. It has nothing to do with alleviating the suffering of the hostages. It has everything to do with extending this war. I mean, I think if you read between the lines, it's hard not to draw that conclusion, okay? Now, I would like for you to give me an answer. If Israel were to declare a ceasefire right now, not tied to release of their hostages, just say, we're gonna stop fighting. What does that do for Israel? What happens to Israel if they stop fighting right now and if Hamas survives? Okay, you tell me right in the comments here. Do you think, am I, am I right or wrong? Does Israel win or lose if they stop fighting before accomplishing their objective to finish this fight and, and destroy Hamas? Nothing good, lose, no, no ceasefire. Okay. Yeah, so I'm looking at your comments here. Now, yeah, you're right. They, they do, they lose, okay. So you guys agree with me. Now, ironically enough, Hamas made the case for Israel today where Israel's saying we're not going to stop fighting until this is over because we have to make it safe for our people. 
That's, that's our goal. Our goal is to make our country safe for Israelis. And thank you, Farmal. In order to make our country safe for Israelis, we have to demolish Hamas. We have to create some safe space for the people that live along the border. And we've got to do something about Hezbollah in the north. And the UN is saying, no, 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 none of that's important. You just need to stop fighting. That's the way to win this thing. Just stop fighting. I mean, it worked great for the United States in Afghanistan. You know, we're in Afghanistan. We just left and the war was over. Well, Hamas made the case for Israel today by firing eight missiles out of, uh, I believe, central Gaza at the city of Ashdod. Uh, if you go, if you're like me, following these launches with your Shofar app, you can see here where they, they had a alert for the entire city of Ashdod today. Now that's the first time in about a month that we've had any kind of serious missile launches out of Gaza itself. Now last week there was like one missile that was fired out of Gaza and it didn't go anywhere, it didn't hit anything. Two of these were shot down, two of these missiles were shot down and, uh, okay. Uh, we're going to start blocking some of these people. Apparently, my team is not on. Okay, I'm going to, I'm, hold on. I'm looking back through some of these comments here. I, I can't, uh, I don't think my uh, moderation team is on. So you guys may have to block these people yourselves. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I've gone back a little ways here. There's one. Okay. All right, try and... Okay, we'll hide those users. All right, so... All right, doing the best I can here, folks. So... How did Hamas make the case for Israel? Well, they attacked Israel yet again after, you know, 170 days of this war with Israel having killed something like 6,000, uh, you know, like 6,000 Hamas fighters. And Hamas is still firing missiles at Israel. So all Israel has to do is just say, you see those contrails up there? That's why we're going into Rafah. That's why we're not stopping. We're, we're gonna keep fighting this thing, okay? Now, in the north, yesterday and the day before, uh, no, I'm sorry, was day before yesterday, let's see. Well, here's what we had today in the north. This is up near Kiryat Shimona, a large, number of rockets and missiles fired out of Lebanon. Uh, the, the rockets that were fired out of Gaza did not cause any injuries or damage. Two of them were shot down, the rest fell in fields and stuff where they didn't hurt anything. I believe, uh, I haven't heard of any, any injuries from the firing from the north, but yesterday or day before, they had 50 rockets fired out of Lebanon into Israel. Look, Israel can't go on like that. They can't keep, keep this up. And so they are making the case for Israel that Israel has to keep fighting. And that's that. I mean, Israel can just say, point to that point period, end of story. We're not stopping. And that's what they're saying. Israel says, we're not going to stop. We're going to go into Rafah. We're going to complete this fight. Benjamin Netanyahu would, uh, I mean, right now, the overall sentiment here in Israel is one of, let's keep this up. They're, they're 
small number of people who have not, who don't think that they should keep fighting, who think they should do whatever is necessary just to get their uh, hostages released. But most people that you talk to on the street here say, just keep fighting. Just, just go until it's over. Now, a lot of people are asking about this whole red heifer thing. This is very interesting to me. Uh, this, this whole red heifer thing. Uh, I, so you've heard me say often, I'm not a expert on biblical prophecy and I'm very loath to make predictions uh, about the future. I don't think that's biblical either, but there's a lot of people that are contacting me about this red heifer thing. And so I was like, okay, fine. I'll, you know, look into it. We'll see what, what's going on. Uh, and what's curious is that this whole red heifer thing, this is something that Americans, American Christians are worried about, very interested in. People here are like, what's the big deal? Like, why are people worried about that? I don't, you know, Israelis are really not spun up about this whole red heifer thing. It's only you guys in the United States that are. I mean, I'm not saying anything wrong with that. It's just interesting that somehow this is going around in the U.S. Like, red heifer, red heifer, red heifer. They're all freaking out about the red heifer. Uh, okay, so the book of Numbers, chapter 19, talks about a red heifer being sacrificed outside the camp and, the ash, and then burned. And the ashes of the red heifer being brought in to ritually cleanse the people of Israel, specific, and, and especially the, the uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Pri not priests. <laughs> uh, the, the Levitical priests, um, you know, the people in charge of the synagogue and all that. Okay. And that they have to be ritually cleansed before the temple can be built. Okay. So that's, that's from Numbers, from the book of Numbers. Now, as you know, the temple is not there anymore. There's a big mosque there where the temple used to be, where most people say the temple used to be. Some people say that the temple wasn't actually there. Um, on our uh, upcoming trip to Israel, uh, which is coming up in October, and if you'd like to join us, we were completely full and we've been working with some tour guides here and stuff. And I think we can squeeze about 10 more people on this trip. So if you want to come to Israel and Jordan with me and have some adventures, uh, it's not gonna be like any normal Israel trip. Let me tell you, this is gonna be a, a little bit different trip. We're gonna go to Jordan first. We're gonna go to Petra. We're gonna go see Crusader uh, castles. Uh, you know, go to a couple of biblical archaeological sites on the Jordanian side. They call that the other Holy Land. And then we're going to cross into Israel and we're going to see some, you know, all the important stuff, the, the stuff that you can't miss, right? Like the garden tomb and et cetera, et cetera. But we're also going to do, see some things that have to do with this war. Uh, maybe go to Re'im where the music festival was. We're going to go to Sterot. Uh, which was attacked on October 7th, where you can actually stand on a hilltop and look into Gaza. So you're going to be able to come with us and do that if you, if you want to. We just opened up 10 more slots on that trip. So if you're interested in joining us in Israel, just send me an email, hotzoneholton at gmail.com. Hotzoneholton at gmail.com. All one word. And... Um, we will send you the link to get on the trip. There's, we're gonna open up 10 more slots. <clears throat> so if you wanna come, that's October 1st through the 10th uh, that we're gonna be going. And so back to this red heifer thing. Matter of fact, I found the red heifer today. It's, an, it's a restaurant right on the other side of that building right there called the red heifer. It's a steakhouse. No, but in, no, all joking aside, I've talked to some people here who seem to be in the know and they say, 
It's true, there are five red heifers that were brought to Israel recently and they're being held in a location, an, an undisclosed location in Shiloh. And there's a well-known, powerful, um, uh, what am I trying to say, rabbi, who is preparing to sacrifice a red heifer. Now, if it does get sacrificed, it likely won't get sacrificed uh, in, in, inside the city walls. It'll be maybe on the Mount of Olives, maybe not. Um, there are not, uh, we're, we're not exactly clear on that. Again, there are a bunch of Americans who are really spun up about this. And I'm kind of ambivalent, really, and I'll tell you why. But anyway, they are preparing the utensils, the blood bowls, the you know golden utensils and everything uh, for this sacrifice to ritually cleanse the, the, the Levitical priest and uh, the, by uh, proxy, the people of Israel so that they can begin to rebuild the temple. But, you know, there's about a billion Muslims that are gonna take issue with that, right? It's gonna be, um, <laughs> it's gonna be uh, very interesting to see if they actually start to rebuild the temple. And again, the Israelis that I've talked to here are not real, uh, they're, they're not real excited about all this. They're just like, whatever. Um, most, uh, if many Israelis are, uh, you know, sort of not super religious. There's a small sect of Jews who are really on fire about this whole thing. And, you know, they're preparing for it. That's all I got. Okay. That's all I've got about the red heifer. Uh, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. What, what I will say, will say is that my own opinion is that the second to last book of the Bible is uh, the book of Jude. And the book of Jude, if you were to, to boil it down to its overarching message, it's, the way I read it, it basically is saying continue to pull people out of the fire until the end. And then you get revelation right after that, which says, you know, basically, and here's how the end comes. I'm not saying that I stop reading in Jude. I'm just saying that I think we put far too little emphasis on the message of the book of Jude of let's not get all, get, get our, you know, undies in a bundle about the red heifers. Let's worry more about the people who will go to hell if the red heifer, you know, if the end does come soon. Let's work on sharing the love of Jesus and telling people about Jesus and submitting ourselves to his plan, his purposes, and that way, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I just, when he comes back, if I'm still kicking, I want him to find me working. I, even if it's making a mistake, and make, making mistakes, I'm gonna be doing my best to yank people out of the fire. And I'm gonna let other people argue about whether or not the red heifer's here and where the thing is gonna be and you know, all that, okay? So if I find out anything more, if I happen to see a red heifer go galloping by down King David Boulevard, I'll certainly let you know. I might go eat at the red heifer after I get done uh, with the live today, because I'm I haven't eaten much today and I'm kind of hungry. And uh, that's a it's a nice looks like a pretty nice restaurant. <laughs> okay. Uh, now I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of mail from you guys because there's a, a, and I do boy I get emails from you guys and and it's like i mean you spend a lot of time i mean 
I get 19 page emails from people instructing me on all the finer points of biblical prophecy and uh, uh, okay, let me just save you the time. It's not that I don't care. It's just that I just don't have the time folks to, uh, I don't have the time to read a 19 page email. And when you send me five of them every day, I promise you they're not getting read. So don't bother. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to do you a favor here. Just don't, don't send them to me because I'm not reading them. I don't have time to read that much. If you send me a short message, I'll read it. If you send me a link to an article, I'll read the article, okay? All right, this person is annoying me. If you're gonna post something, post it once, not 10 times in a row, please. Uh, so, the breaking news for those of you just joining us is twofold. First of all, uh, they have found DNA of one of the uh, hostages, 130 feet underground. Uh, I'm trying to find it again. And that hostage's name, it's a 19 year old female hostage. They found some of her DNA in blood. They found blood on the wall, uh, 130 feet underground in a tunnel inside Gaza. They didn't say what part of Gaza, uh, but they found some evidence that she was there and she was perhaps alive not long ago. Now, we don't know if they're trying to mount an operation to rescue her or anything like that, that's all I know. But that is breaking news right now. Somebody says hostages are dead. Yes, they're, they believe that probably 30 of the 130 hostages are dead. And um, let's hope not, but it's very likely that some of them are dead. But they're gonna still try to recover all their bodies. Now, question, do you think you will see an escalation now from Hamas and Hezbollah? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know that Hamas has much capability left militarily. Uh, they, they do have a bunch of fighters left, but man, the IDF has been picking up a ton of rifles and ammunition and grenades, Semtex, plastic explosive, rocket launchers, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the sheer number, uh, I mean, I've heard some people in the United States trying to make the case. There was a, a show, I think it's called Talking Points Memo, uh, that the other day was this commentator or the actually the anchor man on this news show was trying to make the case that Israel has been losing badly on the ground. I don't know how you make that case. Israel has not been losing badly on the ground. I mean, just... They, they have been very transparent about the number of casualties that they've, that they've taken, and they've lost a little over 250 uh, soldiers since the invasion into Gaza started. Hamas itself admits to having lost about 6,000 fighters since the war started. Um, could be as high as 10,000. That, that represents about half of the fighters that they claim to have had at the beginning of the conflict. So I don't know how you could, just, just from those numbers alone, how do you make a case that Israel, oh, there's that person. How do you make a case that Israel is losing uh, when they've, they've suffered 250 dead and Hamas, itself says that they have lost 6,000 fighters, okay? It's hard, hard to make that case. Now, if you just look at the videos that are coming out, it, the IDF is putting out lots of videos every day showing them taking out tunnel networks, taking down buildings that have been militarized, taking out finding rocket sites, capturing weapons, capturing... Uh, Hamas fighters who are giving themselves up in the hundreds and thousands, okay? 
Hamas is putting out videos every once in a while now that show them shooting at the IDF troops. Usually they're shooting a rocket launcher at a tank or something like that. And they show the explosion when the, the rocket hits the tank and they don't show any battle damage after that. Now, if you shoot a, 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 a RPG, a rocket propelled grenade at a, a tank and that RPG hits the tank, it's gonna make a big fireball, okay? But it's not necessarily going to knock out the tank. It's probably not going to knock out the tank. Those tanks are designed specifically to withstand a hit or multiple hits from RPGs and rocket launchers. So just showing a fireball when you shoot a rocket propelled grenade at a tank tells us nothing about whether or not you disabled that tank. Most likely you did not. And so the videos that are coming out from Hamas basically just show an explosion and then they cut off the video. They don't show any tanks with the turrets blown off. They don't show any tanks burning, black, blackened. You know, they don't show anything like that. Most likely because they're not killing the tanks, okay? Somebody had a question here and I just uh, went by it. Let's see. Let's see here. Uh, where did that question go? I just saw one. It helps if you put your questions in all caps, folks. There we go. Is Hamas still shooting rockets from Gaza uh, or the North the, the, or the West Bank? They weren't ever shooting rockets out of the West Bank, um, not during this war. They shot eight rockets today out of Gaza, and um, they they shot them at the city of Ashdod, and. Two of the rockets were shot down by the Iron Dome system. The others fell out in farmers' fields and stuff. There were no injuries, no damage, as far as I can, uh, uh, from, from reports we're getting. Uh, Hezbollah has been shooting a lot of, uh, a, a lot of rockets, like up to 50 a day, just recently. Uh, and do you hear anything from the Bebus family? No, have not heard anything about that. Will the red heifer indicate the building of the third temple? Okay, so what I understand about the red heifer is that if they sacrifice the red heifer, that by itself does not purify the nation of Israel or the Levitical priests. They have to then, again, this is from Numbers chapter 19, so go read it. Go read Numbers chapter 19. They they sacrifice the red heifer, then they burn the red heifer, then the ashes from the red heifer are brought into the city and have to be shaken on, and the blood from the red heifer has to be shaken on the Levitical priests, and like there's, there's a whole thing. And what that does is that uh, purifies the Levitical priests and by proxy the people of Israel. Then at that point they could get started building the third temple if they were able to but just sacrificing a cow on the mount of olives or anywhere else is not going to enable them to start rebuilding the temple i mean there's a you get you, you understand this there's a gigantic mosque on top of the site of the second temple that would have to be demolished first if that's indeed the site of the temple. Now, again, some people believe, are starting to believe, if you've read uh, Bob Cornuke's book, Temple, that perhaps the temple was actually somewhere else and the site that they're calling the Temple Mount actually was not the Temple Mount. Again, whatever, they, it, it's, it could signify that they are ready to start building the third temple if they had a place to build it, if they had the wherewithal to build it, uh, but just sacrificing a red cow someplace in, in around here is not necessarily going to bring that about in and of itself. That's my understanding. I'm sure I'll get tons of emails from people who know more than I do about it, 
uh, and correcting me on my the finer points that I'm missing here, okay? Uh, so the, the two breaking news pieces that I've got for you today are that they found DNA evidence of one of the hostages, female, 19 years old, that was being held in a tunnel in Gaza. That's one. That came out right before I went live. The other breaking news is that the UN Security Council voted to call for an immediate and total ceasefire on the, on the part of Israel. They're not calling for a ceasefire on the part of Hamas. And that ceasefire they're calling for is not tied in any way to the release of hostages. The resolution that the United States put forward yesterday was tied to a release of hostages. They were saying it's imperative that we have a ceasefire and that we have the release of hostages. That was vetoed by Russia and Iran, I think, or China, Russia and China. The one that was passed today without objection from the United States. The United States did not veto it. They just abstained. They just stood back and just let it happen, which was a absolute betrayal of Israel. It was throwing Israel under the bus. Don't make any mistake about that. Okay? And it passed. They passed one calling for an immediate ceasefire and had, and had no language regarding the hostages whatsoever. So what they're saying is, we want Israel to stop fighting even though Hamas has not stopped fighting. And we don't care whether or not the hostages get released or not. So they're, if, if, they're, if you extrapolate from that, the message is Hamas has every right to take and hold innocent Israeli women and children hostage. Thank you for that, Greg. Very kind of you. It's saying that Hamas has every right to take and hold hostages from Israel, but Israel does not have the right to defend itself. That is the message of the UN resolution that was passed today. That's the breaking news for you. All right? So if you have any further questions, please ask them now. I'm going to uh, just let you know, I, I am going live on my own channel. Thank you, Tony. Very kind of you, Joshua19. Um, USA is most likely Babylon. Check the background where you are, it's beautiful. Yeah, isn't this beautiful? This is the YMCA, believe it or not. The, the YMCA hotel in downtown Jerusalem, right across from the King David Hotel on King David Street. Uh, I'm only a half mile from the old city of Jerusalem. And this building was built by the same architect who built the Empire State Building in New York and about the same time, 1910, 1910 maybe, something like that. And it is a gorgeous building. I'll just turn the, this around. It might be too bright for you to see that, but there's a big tunnel right here, a tunnel, a big tower. Look at this. That tower is, uh, or was for about 30 years, the tallest building in Jerusalem. Uh, so my, okay, so I'll, I'll be doing more lives over on my YouTube channel, which is called The Hot Zone with Chuck Holton, right here on YouTube. You can go over there and you can subscribe and get notified when I go live over there. I did a live this morning from right over here in, on King David Boulevard because it's the celebration of Purim, uh, which is a celebration of the people of Israel being saved, the Jews being saved, by by Queen Esther from the Persian king Xerxes uh, in the, from the book of Esther. So they read the book of Esther. There's a lot of kind of, I mean, this is the first time I've ever been here for Purim. Weird uh, traditions in, in my opinion. I mean, it's kind of strange. Uh, they dress up in all sorts of strange um, costumes. I mean, I saw some really weird costumes. 
they had some floats. Uh, they had a big parade here today. And it's not just the kids that dress up in costumes, the adults do. And they're telling, they told me that in, uh, during Purim, they are commanded to party and specifically commanded to get drunk. I don't know where they get that from, but that sounds like a party, all right. And many of them were. <laughs> they, they were they were certainly partying last night. Uh, here in Jerusalem, I guess, Purim last two days, and outside Jerusalem, it only last one, something like that. I don't know. I'm, uh, again, not an expert on these things. Is the United Nations toothless? Not exactly toothless, uh, Nate. They are... The United Nations, again, could call for sanctions on Israel. Uh, they could put together a peacekeeping force. They're not going to do that, but they, they could. Uh, as you may or may not know, there are UN peacekeeping forces all around Israel. So if you go to the north, north you have UNFIL. If you go to Syria, you have a, a UN force there on their border. If you go to the south, you have UNRWA which has now been defunded by the United States and several other country, countries. The, the United Nations has spent literally billions of dollars uh, and, and most of that money has been wasted in, uh, on all of these forces around Israel. UNFIL, which is in southern Lebanon, is supposed to ensure that the Hezbollah operatives do not come south of the Latani River. Uh, so about 10, 15 miles uh, from the border, they're supposed to stay north of that and not bother. They do that on, on purpose. They, they put them there in the 1970s to ensure that Hezbollah did not uh, bother Israel and Israel didn't bother Hezbollah. They have been absolutely worthless, worse than worthless. Those guys uh, we've found out there, there's lots of proof that they have to get permission from, uh, from Hezbollah before they move anywhere. Unfil cannot drive on roads unless they get permission from Hezbollah to, to, to be on that road. They can't leave their bases unless they get permission from Hezbollah to leave their bases. And Hezbollah uses them as shields to shoot at the Israelis. So they put their rocket launchers right next to the UN bases along the border so that if Israel fires back, they risk hitting a, a, a UN base. So that's not helpful. And of course, they've done absolutely nothing to keep Hezbollah north of the Latani River, right? Of course, UNRWA, we're finding out most of UNRWA, uh, UNRWA apparently is a wholly owned subsidiary of Hamas. So they're useless, worse than worthless. They're actually working on behalf of Hamas. You have the group up in Syria that's done virtually nothing to keep any attacks from happening from the Syrian side. So, uh, <laughs> all right, so yeah, that's that. Anyway, I'll be uh, doing more reporting from here in Israel, from Jordan, from my recent trip to Armenia and my recent trip to Burma, you can find all of that over on my Hot Zone podcast here on YouTube, The Hot Zone with Chuck Holton. You can also go to chuckholton.com and you can follow me there. And uh, I put up articles that further explain the things that I'm talking about on these lives. I put up uh, links to my documentaries. I've got 65 documentaries. I put up links to my books. I've got 10 books in print. Uh, so you can find out way more about Chuck Holton and all the things that I'm involved in. Uh, links to the trips that we're taking to Armenia and to Jordan and to Israel. And you can join us on those trips if you like uh, by going over to chuckholton.com. You can subscribe over there. So um, please like and share this podcast and donate to CBN. You can go to cbn.com and get a tax deduction by donating that way. You can donate right here on YouTube as some of you have already today. Thank you very much for doing that. I really appreciate all of you. And uh, so before we go, uh, let's pray for Israel. And let's pray for this, um, you know, betrayal of Israel that we saw today 
in the United Nations, okay? Lord God, we come to you today with our, with our hearts burdened uh, for Israel. Lord, we, uh, we are concerned about this betrayal of Israel today by the United States and by the United Nations. The United Nations, which uh, was in some sense created around the, uh, the foundation, uh, the founding of the nation of Israel and had a lot to do with that, Lord. But yet the United Nations has so lost its way and it's become a tool in the hands of the globalists to denigrate your people, to attack your people, and to, to really try to destroy the nation of Israel. So Lord, we pray that you would thwart the, uh, the plans of the United Nations as it regards to Israel. We pray that you would cause the United States to stand up, to not be cowardly, to stand up for Israel and to support Israel in their, their fight against Hamas. Lord, we pray that you would deny Hamas the weapon of the United Nations, the weapon of uh, the misery of their own people, and that you would cause them to lay down their arms and to give up so that this could end quickly and the suffering in those people could end. We, we see what Hamas is doing, Lord. We see that Hamas wants their people to suffer. We know that you don't. So we pray, Lord, that you would show yourself powerful in this situation and that you would supernaturally put an end to this conflict, Father. As I stand here in front of this building, which is so covered with scripture, which was dedicated to the glory of God, we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in everything that happens here in Jerusalem, Father. We pray that you would protect the, the Jewish people. We pray that you would protect the Christians that are here. We pray that you would protect the, the industries, the tourists who come here to, to worship. And again, Lord, that people would find you when they come here to this place, whether they're Jew or Muslim or Christian or Druze or any other religion, Father. We pray that you would be glorified in this place. Please, Lord, send your hand of protection on the IDF as they prosecute this conflict and let them prosecute it till the end. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, thank you very much. Really appreciate you being on uh, uh, this breaking news today. Again, just one more time, uh, the DNA from one of the female, 19-year-old female hostages was found today in a tunnel in Gaza. And... Uh, hopefully they can find her alive very soon. Please pray for that. Also, the UN and the United States both threw Israel under the bus. So please keep praying for the nation of Israel and stand with them. All right. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow. Take care.